alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh Welcome to the live Facebook on this special show dedicated to the father of the Hujjah of our time May Allah hasten his reappearance Imam al-Hassan al-Askari Now we have been commemorating and have been going through a sorrowful time with the uh, season of Arba'in and recently we have seen the flag change but the sorrow and the grief continues and inshallah, majority of us will be commemorating the death of the 11th Imam tomorrow night, inshallah, at our local Husseiniyah. But tonight at Imam Hussein TV3, myself, Mosin Shah, and my guest, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banju, inshallah, would like to discuss with you uh, the life of Imam Hassan al Askari and also um, the ziyara of Samara, inshallah. So I'd like to welcome my guest. Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banju. Assalamu alaykum, Sheikh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you this evening? Alhamdulillah wa shukar. A'adhama la ujurana wa ujurakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for our grief and intensify our grief in regards to the martyrdom of uh, Imam Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari. Okay. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Sheikh, give us a little, you know, a biography because I think Imam Hassan al-Askari may be one of the most unfortunately neglected imams but one of the most significant and important figures considering he is the father of the hujja of our time uh, maybe a little on where he's buried and a little bit about his his life and, and uh, you know the, the troubles he had of course imam hassan al askari alayhi salam the extent of his madlumiya and the oppression can be understood from the very fact that he was poisoned at the age of 28. That's it, 28. A youth at the age oh. of 28 oh. poisoned and his assassination coordinated by the most powerful empire to have ruled the earth. Muhakkikin have come forward and they state that the empire of Bani Abbas stretched from as far as North Africa all the way to the borders of China, present-day China. This vast majority of earth as we know it was ruled by Bani Abbas. And from all the enemies and foes and threats that you may think Bani Abbas may have, they decided to channel and to concentrate their entire military efforts and coordinate and plan for the assassination of this youth, you could say. The shining star of Bani Hashim, a wali from the awliya of Allah, a khalifa from the khulafa of Allah Azza wa Jal, Imam Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari alayhi salam. And therefore you find that within his age, the age at which he was martyred, in itself, there is a big dalala and an indication for the threat that he posed towards Bani Abbas. Imam al-Askari alayhi salam buried in the land of Samarra. And the land of Samarra became blessed and became divine due to the burial of the blessed bodies of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari yes. inside of Samarra. And it is very important over here and last night as well, uh, I had mentioned in a majlis for some of the mu'mineen and mu'minat the importance of the ziyara of Samarra Definitely. and the visitation of Samarra. In fact, tomorrow, Thursday, you have the istishad of Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. You will find that without exaggeration, hundreds and thousands, if not millions, hundreds and thousands of people from all over Iraq, from many parts of the world going to Samarra to pay tribute and to renew their allegiance with Imam al-Askari and commemorate his shahada at the very shrine of Imam al-Askari inside of Samarra. And um, you find that Samarra, I believe it was perhaps with yourself, that we had held in one of the shows the commemoration of the bombing anniversary Indeed. of the haram Indeed. of Imam al-Askari and the Imam al-Hadi inside of Samarra. You find that Samarra has, has historically been the seat of uh, Bani Abbas's Khilafah having moved from Baghdad, they moved to Samarra. Samarra being a military garrison mm -hmm. uh, in contemporary history 
even after the invasion of Iraq, you find that Samarra was a very unstable area. It had almost become a, a, a place that the terrorists such as Daesh had hoped that they would be able to have Saitara and full control over the city of Samarra. And it was a place of great unrest. And uh, the bombing of Samarra was very evident on how the people wanted to use the land of Samarra and destroy the Dari of Imam al-Askari as an announcement of their hatred and their war against Shiaism, Tashayyu and Imam al-Hujjah. In essence, it was not just a random bombing that had happened. There was a deep message and a very stern message behind that, the bombing of that shrine. For in any case, you find that Alhamdulillah with the barakat of Mawlana Sahib al-Amri wa zaman the juhud and the efforts of the virtuous maraja and uh, the barakat of the uh, mu'mineen and mu'minat, people of Iraq and outside of Iraq, Alhamdulillah, who have contributed towards safeguarding Samarra the security apparatus that has been installed in order to make sure that Samarra is a safe heaven for the Zawar of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. And we, these are things that we need to appreciate. And these are things that we, I believe we need to discuss on the Shahada of Imam al-Askari, on the Wilada of Imam al-Askari. The strategic importance of Samarra in this day and age as a place of ziyara. Alhamdulillah wa shukar, you find that millions and millions of people who went for Arba'een this year, who went to Iraq for Ashura, the Arba'een before that, every year we've been able to see progress in Samarra. There was a time seven, eight, ten years back where it was almost unthinkable for people to go to Samarra. And uh, the security concerns were very many, even though we are of the opinion and a number of the Maraja are of the opinion that even if there is a security threat on your life to uphold the ziyara takes priority. In either case, you find, and many people did, you have a number of shuhada, zawar who ended up becoming shuhada while embarking upon this journey to perform the ziyara of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. And we are not talking about a very long time back, we are talking about 7, 10, 12 years back. And you will see that, alhamdulillah, the progress in terms of the security and how people have worked hard and institutions have worked hard in order to ensure that people like you and I are able to perform the ziyara of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askar in Samarra. And even this year in Arba'een, alhamdulillah wa shukar, the haram of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari was filled with zawar, mashaAllah where they had programs of Majalis. I believe Imam Hussein TV has a, a Bith Mubashar live broadcast for the Majalis from inside the Sahan of Imam al-Askari. And there are Raduds doing Latam and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Zawar passing through Samarra on the days of Arba'in. Uh, uh, this last Arba'in that had passed, Shahrum Muharram for Ashura, the year before that as well. There are even arrangements for people to spend the night inside of Samarra. MashaAllah. And Alhamdulillah, you find that the Ataba of Imam al-Askari has gone, has, has done a lot of work. Uh, and uh, the Marja'i of Ayatollah al-Udma Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi, uh, may Allah grant him and the virtuous Maraja a long and healthy life, have played an instrumental role in ensuring that uh, Samarra is secured uh, for the Zawar, the Haram in itself is secured in itself. And uh, Alhamdulillah, we see the Barakat and the Juhud, uh, yani, uh, uh, food in the name of Imam al Hussein, in the name of Imam al Askari, is served from the Ataba. I remember last year, Shahram Muharram, uh, when uh, we were blessed to be over there, we spent the night inside of Samarra, and the Haram was open the entire night. And it was very beautiful in the Sahan. You see parts of the Sahan, people are sleeping, others are in the, doing their uh, Aza and their Matam, others are crying, others are reciting Salatul Layl. You go down in the Sardab, in the middle of the night, people are reciting Dua and Nudba, so on, so forth. 
<coughs> so alhamdulillah the importance of the city of samarra and uh, yani my advice humble advice is that uh, and i've said this before and the repetition of the message because of the importance of the message it is important for all of us as zawar from the west from africa wherever we are going leaders of groups that take other zawar for ziyara do not ignore samarra as a destination for ziyara i would even go further and say do not make samarra a transit point where you are there just for a day trip the way we say it a couple of hours and then come back la imam al hadi imam al askari sayyida narjis sayyida hakima they are all buried within yes. the dharih and then you have the sardab of imam al hujja mm-hmm. we need to have marasim when we go there for ziyara that we sit in the sardab and we recite dua al ahad Yes. The dua to pledge our allegiance to Imam al hujja yes. We need to have dua and nudba recited mm-hmm. inside over there. This needs to be part and parcel of the ziyara from the adab and the akhlaq of visiting Samarra that we sit hours inside of the sardab and we weep and we wail for Imam al hujja We renew the, our pledge with the Imam Zaman of our time. Ajallallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif and this is the importance of the ziyara of Samarra and I'm sure yourself you visited Samarra was in Arba'in inshallah. Blessed. I was there on I think it was the 3rd, 4th of November I was there alhamdulillah uh, I managed to go to Samarra and like you said it, there has been great progress in terms of the restructure and also in terms of um the facilities and infrastructure around the area um before we couldn't cross the bridge we had to walk um of course. across the long bridge and then from there is another look, it's, it's, i think it's about a mile roughly of walking uh, you have to do but alhamdulillah this time we managed to cross the bridge it was open access and go very very close to the actual city uh very close to the checkpoints and then you just get searched and you walk straight in and sure. and alhamdulillah uh, the actual um the haram itself they're still rebuilding there's a lot of work going on but uh, if i manage to go downstairs and it's all marbled out into the sadab it's yeah. really really nice now and it's very very open i think it's it's bigger than the actual haram itself upstairs alhamdulillah uh, there's a lot of space uh, you can see great development sure. um, the mawakibs there the was yeah mawakibs, they were giving food yeah on the way on the way yeah, yeah, yeah. Try even after what the what was really board. impressive this this year for arba'in was um previous years i've been on arba'in and 2 3 days after arbain is is quiet is empty this year it, it kept getting busy it, it stayed the busyness stayed people were leaving but it was still a lot busier than normal and it was really really like strange for me i was like normally it's not this busy i haven't seen as many people and this is the same with najaf baghdad and samarra there was probably arguably double what i was expecting uh, what I was, I was expecting to see and what I've ex- previously experienced so alhamdulillah there is more and more happening alhamdulillah and um I do have to mention this is that <laughs> in Samarra there's the new toilets that have been made and they are amazing they are very very clean and they're so big uh, you go there's an elevator it's that big there's a lift for you to go down to the toilets and yeah, and they've got eastern toilets western toilets big facilities for wudu uh, even shower facilities as well, I believe. So, like, there, there is a lot of investment, alhamdulillah, in Samarra. Um, we hope the houses can open again um, in, in Samarra, inshallah, inshallah. And there can be further development for the Zawar, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. There is a, there is a relief and development, and actually a development plan for resuscitating Samarra as a city yes. from an economic perspective. Um, having people re-migrate back to Samarra, rebuild the city of Samarra, ensure that there are uh, the local industry in terms of mm-hmm. shops, in terms of hotels, why not? Yes. In terms of schools, for families to migrate back to Samarra, for Shia families to come back over there, and for Samarra as a city to return back to the glory that it deserves because of the two kings who are buried inside of Samarra. And inshallah, our hope and our anticipation is that the city of Samarra would become just like the way the city of Karbala is today and the Mm -hmm. city of Najaf is today and the city of Qadmain is today, inshallah. And um, the first step towards this 
is uh, for the zawar themselves to make this conscious effort to go to Samarra and actually spend time over there. And even within the haram or around the precincts of the haram, there is, there is a lot of history that is, uh, that is uh, there within the city of Samarra. And uh, inshallah, uh, step by step, we are, able to, um, uh, we are able to explore all of this. It's a part of our heritage and it's a part of our legacy, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ta bless each and every person who makes the journey to Samarra to uphold the dhikr and uh, up, uh, uphold the legacy of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari alayhim as salam. Inshallah, inshallah. Insha Shaykhna, do you feel that, because I feel this personally, that Imam al-Askari is, is very neglected considering he's such an important figure and considering he is the father of the Hujjah of, of, of today, um, what can we do to maybe you know, improve our, our relationship and to honour the legacy of Imam Hassan Askari? What can we do better? Of course, the first thing that we need to do is, we have a number of things that we need to do. Number one, reviving the shahadat and the wiladat of Imam Al-Askari alayhi salam. Our attendance in the Husseiniyat have to be at their peak when it comes to the wilad of Imam al-Askari and when it comes to the shahada of Imam al-Askari. Even the, the shahada on a night like this or tomorrow night, uh, we have to have maximum participation. You know, uh, in some of the centers that uh, I used to serve in, uh, we, there used to be this mentality. And uh, it's, it's very weird and it sounds very petty as well, but it's a reality. There used to be this uh, mentality that there is a big imam and a small imam. Oh. Uh, a big shahada and a small shahada. Yani an important shahada and a not important shahada. And unfortunately, the ignorance of the people is that the small shahada, the small imam, would be the likes of Imam al-Askari. Yeah, this is the first point that we need to change. And the people running the Husseiniyas, the people administering the Husseiniyas, or the khutaba reciting the majlis, for example. Sometimes they may think, La, okay, majlis Imam al-Askari, I don't need to prepare as much as I need to prepare for another majlis. La, this is wrong. Hujjatullah fil ard, the way you said. So therefore, number one, this importance from uh, the people running the Husseiniyas, reciting the majlis, khutaba al-kiram, we have to have the, create that fervor and that atmosphere. I cannot come and say, okay, because it's Shahada Imam al-Askari, you know what, today the time for Matam will only be three minutes or four minutes. Why? Because the small Imam is not important. La Aib hey. is actually an insult to Imam al-Askari, an insult to Imam al-Hujjah against any one of the Imams. Such an insult is an insult to Imam al Hussein, is an insult to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The Imams have a hurma, awaluna Muhammad, Akhiruna uh, Muhammad, Awsatuna Muhammad, Kulluna Muhammad, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam has a special position without doubt. Amir al Mu'minin has a special position without doubt. But we cannot have such a mentality within a community where Imam al Askari is seen as the lesser important Imam. For this is one of the greatest steps that need to be done. And this is an issue that we, it's, it's a problem that we suffer uh, within our local centers. Truth has to be told in that sense. And this mentality has to change. It has to change from the managing committees. It has to change from within the madaris. It has to change from the member. Importance, <coughs> excuse me, showing the people the divinity and the importance of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. This is one. Number two, to connect with our Imam. <coughs> excuse me, to connect with our Imam ilm. Knowledge about the Imam, the life of the Imam, the contributions of the Imam towards humanity, towards the Shia Ummah, the struggles that the Imam had. The more we read the history of Imam al-Askari, the more we are able to relate to him. The more we read his words, the more familiar we are with the teachings of the Imam, the more we fall in love with this Imam. <coughs> Having said this, You'll see that one great book, I will show the live faith book. Alhamdulillah, almost every week we've been concentrating on a certain number of books. 
Last week, if you remember and if our mushahideen remember, the book that we had introduced is Kalimat al-Rasul al-A'adam. The words are the sayings of the Holy Prophet. And this is part of an encyclopedia authored by the late Shaheed Ayatollah Sayyid Hassan al-Shirazi. Where he has a, rahmatullah alayhi, where he has a encyclopedia or collection of the words and the sayings of the Ma'sumin From Rasulullah all the way down to the 12th Imam, their letters, their uh, sayings, so on and so forth. And you find within the book... This is one of the greatest books that I have come across in regards to, uh, with all due respect to all of the writers, scholars, every book has a taste, every book has a dimension of analysis. From all these books, you know, one book that definitely stands out is uh, this book entitled Kalimatul Imam Al Askari. Do we have time to go into the index or not really? Few yes, minutes, do, inshallah. Do, 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 you so find you, that. All the time in the world, Barakallah fikum. For Imam al Askari, alayhi salam. You find, for example, within this book, if you were just to look at the index in itself, you look at the variety of the knowledge and the teachings that emanated from Imam al Askari that allow us to connect with Imam al Askari. So, for example, there's an entire collection of a hadith entitled Ilahiyat. So, you have a number of hadith. In regards to understanding Tawheed from Imam Hassan al Askari, salam. each and every one of us has an opinion of what God should be, what the Creator should be, how He should function. This is an opinion that you and I have. Why do we not go sit back and look what is the opinion or what are the words of Imam al Askari when it comes to understanding mm -hmm. Tawheed? Mm -hmm. I follow Fulan scholar and Fulan scholar and Fulan, why when I have words of Imam Hassan al Askari salam, understanding Allah through the words of the Ma'asum Imam? Similarly, within this book, we have a collection of hadith which is entitled as Nabuwiyah Nabu, uh, in regards to the Nabuwa, where he speaks about the Nabuwa of a number of the Anbiya. So, for example, uh, Imam al Askari has hadith on uh, Nabi Adam being in Jannah. He has got another hadith of the relationship between Rasulullah and Surah Al Fatiha. The Surah Al Fatiha, which is wajib for us to recite in every wajib salah. The miracles of the Holy Prophet, for example. The uh, hypocrites and the Holy Prophet, for example. <coughs> the Quran and the Huruf al Mukatta'ah. You have surahs that start Alif, La, Mim, yes. Yasin. What is their philosophy? What is their understandings? These are treasures of knowledge that have emanated from Imam al Askari. And the same thing, you have a number of hadith of, from Imam al Askari in regards to Wilaya. Today, you and I, who claim to be Shias of Amirul Mu'mineen, the definitions of sectarianism, what, is it, what does it mean to be extreme or not extreme as a Shia in regards to your faith? <coughs> These are all outlined for us by Imam al Askari through a number of the hadith. We have hadith on Aqa'id and how the relationship between the wilaya of Ali Muhammad and the Malaika. The, even the Malaika believe in this. Uh, the concept of peace and submission within the Quran. Inshallah. You have akhlaq, the importance of tawadu, the importance of being humbleness, the evils of being stingy and so on and so forth. So you find that almost every aspect of our life, when it comes to ibadat, we were, not, we were created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for the purpose of worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find that from the ibadat, the ways of worship and the mannerisms of worship taught to us by Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam, we have got number one, Salat Ayam al isbu' For every day of the week, from the nawafil, from the mm -hmm. recommended prayers, there is a particular Salat to be recited every day of the week. Which Salat should be recited on Saturday, on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Masha Wednesday. Allah, Allah. These are all outlined to us by who? By Imam Masha Hassan Allah. al Askari. And then we have uh, Kunut, 
Yeah. We have the kunut of Imam Hassan al askari What did yeah. Imam used to recite in his kunut in salah? These mm -hmm. are things that connect us with our ma'asum imam. We have, for example, the institution of ziyara that Imam al askari established. And you see he comes forward being in Samarra. He used to encourage the people to perform the ziyara of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq in Janatul Baqi'ah. You find that... Uh, a hadith in regards to fiqh, uh, the uh, uh, apportionment of inheritance. Mm -hmm. All these ahadith you find, for example, from the teachings and the words of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa Du'as for every imam, for every imam, Imam al-Askari has taught us how to recite a particular salawat. Mashallah. You want to send peace and blessings on Amir al Yes. How should you send peace and blessings upon him? There is a salat taught to us by him. How to recite salawat on Amir al Mu'minin? How to recite salawat on Imam Hassan and Imam al Hussein? How to recite salawat on Imam al Baqir? How to recite salawat on Imam al Sadiq? So on and so forth. The entire connection, in my opinion, what is needed within the Gaiba of the Imam to remain connected with the deen is found within the teachings of Imam Hassan al Askari. MashaAllah, Sans Sheikh. We're going to go to a short break, inshallah. Uh, really looking forward to the next half. Inshallah, join us on the next half where, inshallah, the Sheikh will be talking more on the life of Imam Hassan Askari and, inshallah, a couple of hadith from the book, inshallah. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live faith book. Um, we were discussing with Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banju in regards to uh, the life of Imam Hassan al Askari. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion. Sheikhna, <coughs> tell us a little about the, the troubles and challenges of uh, Imam Hassan al Askari. Ahsanti, Imam Hassan al Askari, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, his entire life and for the time that he accompanied his father, Imam al Hadi, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi was filled with trials and tribulations. And the role that Imam al-Askari played was very, very crucial. Number one, in regards to protecting the faith from deviation during his lifetime. And number two, preparing the ummah for the ghaibah of the coming Imam. And you find over here that in order to prepare the people meant that يعني, you are safeguarding their faith <coughs> for the future. And this role was very, very crucial for Imam al-Askari because he was that final link before the ghaibah of the Imam would begin, mm -hmm. the ghaibah of his son. And therefore, the preparations that were needed uh, to be done in order or the strategic steps that needed to be taken and be put into place in order to prepare the ummah to survive, rather to flourish and to uphold their faith during this ghaiba, this responsibility to a great extent fell on Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. And you find that the deviations that Imam al-Askari during the time of Imam al-Askari were numerous. And the Imam, despite being subjected to imprisonment within a military garrison, a military prison, with spies of the highest level from the intelligence agencies of Bani Abbas having an eye on him, you find that Imam al-Askari, despite being in this situation, was able to lead a revolution in terms of ensuring that this deen of Ali Muhammad is not diluted or no deviation creeps into it. And you find that there were a number of ideologies that had sprung up during the time of Bani Abbas that were actually being supported by Bani Abbas in order 
to deviate the people and distract them from the teachings and the leadership of Ali Muhammad. Ali Muhammad, Imam al Askari, salam, his leadership and his superiority was extremely visible for all the people. It was something very easy to establish. Why? Through his ilm. Yes. And hence, Bani Abbas did everything and anything within their power to ensure that Imam al Askari would not have the opportunity to demonstrate this ilm towards the people. And therefore, they created, they created, and they branded, and they advertised, and they marketed different schools of thoughts that would then be portrayed <clears throat> as the true teaching of Islam, the alternate version to the version of Imam al-Askari. Mm. Competitors of Imam al-Askari, if you could use that word for us to understand. And you find over here, for example, within this uh, book of uh, Shaheed uh, Atullah Hassan al-Shirazi, you find that he speaks about an event that had happened with one of the individuals who had caused a great rift within the community. And this was a person who was advocating Sufi teachings. Okay. Mannerisms of connecting with God. They didn't come and tell you to do shirk. They didn't come and tell you abandon Tawheed and go to this or that. La, they were portraying a form of Islam and the form of connecting with God. The word is this. Connecting with Allah, Yani. They were teaching a form of spirituality that was not endorsed by Ahlul Bayt. Look at how sensitive the issue is. Indeed, indeed. And look at how relevant the issue is today. Indeed. <clears throat> Within the Muslim world, you yeah, believe the Muslim world, within the Shia world, we have a number of people who advocate a brand of spirituality, a brand of being God conscious by surpassing Ahlul Bayt. And you find that Imam al Askari condemned these people. Why? Because they were causing ideological rifts within the community. An ideological rift means that if you somebody becomes deviated, he goes to Nar Jahannam. Well, wow. Wow. And hence the Imams took a very strong stance against people like these. One of them was uh, by the name of, you see the Imam says over here, Ahdiru as Sufi al Mutasanni'ah. Be careful of this superficial. Uh, Sufis, Sufis, yani, a, a, a sect that had come up that was practicing a form of spirituality, having deviated from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Not every version of spirituality is the correct version of spirituality. We need spirituality as for the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Indeed. And this is in regards to an individual known as Ahmad ibn Hilal. Look at the characteristics of Ahmad ibn Hilal. Kad kana hajja arba'a wa khamsin hajja or hijja ishroon minha ala kadame. He went for hajj arba'a wa khamsin hijja. He went to on hajj 54 times. From these 54 times, 20 times he went to Hajj on foot. Allah. Inshallah. Religious personality comes across as being muttaqi, alim, scholar, speaks about Allah, goes for Hajj on foot. Imam al Askari says, Don't be deceived by the exterior. Wakana ruwat ashabna bil Iraq. He says, our companions, 
of the Imam, the companions of Imam al Askar and Imam al Hadi, they met with this person, Ahmad ibn Hilal, and they even recorded narrations from him that he would record or narrate on behalf of the Imams before Imam al Hadi and yes. Imam al Jawad. So, Imam al Askari dispraised this person through a writing. And the Shias were confused. They said, we don't believe that Imam al-Askari would dispraise or condemn such a pious looking person who is known for hadith and this and that. Like today in this day and age, people quote Amir al-Mu'mineen, but they do tahrif of the meaning of the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen said something, they distort the interpretation of the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And somebody comes and tells you, how can you criticize him? Speak about Amir al-Mu'mineen, speak about Allah. Yeah, the, Kadiyah, the issue is more deeper than that. And look at what the Imam says. Ibn Hilal, la rahimahullah. When the Imam speaks about this guy, Ibn Hilal, who has gone for Hajj 54 times, 20 times on feet, Imam al Asghari says, la rahimahullah. May Allah not have mercy on him. Wow. Meaning what? Nar Jahannam wa bi'sal masih. When the Imam says something like that, you've, you've got no hope. Wa lam yazal la ghafar Allah lahu dhamba. May Allah till today not forgive him for the sins that he's committed. What sin did he commit? Indeed. It's not a personal sin. He didn't pray. He didn't fast. This, that. The sin was so grievous, he deviated people from the right path. What did he used to do? Yudakhil fi amrina bila idhnin minna. He used to interfere in our affairs without our permission. Mm-hmm. Used to speak about our religion in the name of our religion without having any authority within our, within our religion. This is the grievous point. He was branding a form of tashayyu or a form of Islam. Benefiting from the authority of the Imams when the Imams did not even give him that authority. A person comes forward and aligns himself with Ahlul Bayt, portrays himself as an authority within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt when he's not even an authority to begin with. Many th- we see this in this day and age as well. A number of communities, Baba. These are not new issues. These are issues that exist from the time of Imam al Askari. لا يمدي من أمرنا إلا بما يحوى ويريد. He says, when he speaks about the religion, he doesn't speak, he doesn't convey our commands to the people. Hmm. Rather, he preaches his own opinion to the people. Hmm. And through this opinion of his, a self-opinionated religion, he deviated and was the reason of the deviation of a number of people. Somebody might come and tell you, Ya Shaykhuna, does that mean there is no freedom of speech in Islam? When it comes to issues of theology, correct, there is. Of course there is freedom of speech. But freedom within boundaries that has to be respected. Indeed. Like the way you have the freedom to use a knife. (laughs) Yes. But that doesn't allow you that you use this knife to go and stab people on the street. Somebody comes and stabs you with his knife. And then when I condemn him, can he come back and say, Shaykhna, you're abusing or restricting my freedom to use a knife? La, if your freedom is causing harm to somebody else, then that freedom needs to be restricted. Mm-hmm. This is something mantiki. So the same way, if a person is harming the ideology of somebody, killing the soul, which is more worthy than the body. Imam al Askari teaches us over here. And you see that he stepped into the core of the issue. And he issued a tawqiyya, a letter condemning Ahmed ibn Hilal. So we understand from here that not only did he himself take an active step in educating the masses to be aware of those individuals who come across as being pious and scholars and leaders, yet they deviate the people away from the teachings of Ali Muhammad. And the Imam expected from his Shia that they would also stand up and would make the wider Shia community aware of these people. Out of malice? No. Out of hate? No.
out of this one principle that you are taking people towards the fire, eternal hellfire. And such individuals are not any lesser than serial killers. You let a serial killer loose on the street. He goes and he kills everybody. Yes. And this one kills the soul. Mm. Not only does he take away your dunya from you, he takes away your akhirah from you. This was one of the challenges. You find that even, I was saying this yesterday to a number of the mu'minin, mu'minat within one of the majalis. Even Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. Yes. The fam- the fam- the, oh, he's the famous author. What is known as the Sahih Bukhari. Yes. It was compiled during the lifetime of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. Mm. And Bani Abbas branded him as this virtuous, qualified scholar through whom Islam could be understood. He was marketed and branded and funded by Bani Abbas as a competitor to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and Imam al-Askari in particular. You find he lived during the time of Imam al-Askari. There is not, he was not persecuted for compiling and spreading the knowledge of Rasulullah. But subhanallah, when Imam al-Askari preaches the uh, words of Rasulullah, he was persecuted. Imam al-Askari spoke about Tawheed, he got imprisoned. Bukhari spoke about Tawheed and <laughs> Nashar. And subhanallah, you see the difference in the Tawheed of Bukhari and the Tawheed of... Indeed. Astaghfirullah, Indeed. you can't yes. even put both these names. It is the same statement. Where Imam al-Askari and anybody else from the Makhlukin. But in any way, you find over here that these were alternate authorities that were created by Bani Abbas who were then marketed and branded as scholars to deviate the people and distract the people from Imam al-Askari. And at the same time, Imam al-Askari has been imprisoned in Samara, away from the rest of the Islamic Ummah, to isolate him and his teachings. But subhanAllah, Allah is the best of planners. And you find from the divine hikmah of Imam al-Askari, his teachings spread and every corner of the Islamic world. So... This was one great challenge that the Imam tackled and ensured that he tackled during his life. Stopping the deviation from creeping into the teachings of Ali Muhammad and deviation of the Shia. This was one. Number two, you find a crucial role of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam was to prepare the people for the ghayba of his son, Mawlana Sahib al-Amri wa zaman salawatullahi wa salamhu alayhi. This was going to be the most sensitive and the most fragile time for the Shia Ummah. The beginning of ghaybat is sughra is a very, very fragile time. There are important phases, make or break phases within Shia history. One of them is this beginning point of Ghaybat al-Sukhra and another one is the beginning point of Ghaybat al-Kubra. Each one of them have their own particular challenges and if you were to sit down and analyze the challenges that the Shia Ummah faced at that time, there are avenues of history that open up for you that perhaps majority of the people are ignorant. Siddiq, I tell you, for for true, for real, Baba, we would need five nights. Ayyam al askariya Just to talk about, highlight the challenges the Shia faced, particularly at the beginning of Ghaybat al sughra and the beginning of Ghaybat al kubra Just these two time frames, cut these two pieces together. Isolate them in history and ya subhanallah, the challenges that, that were there and how the people overcame these challenges. You find over here that when it came to preparing the ummah for the ghaibah of the imam, the imam took a number of steps. And you find again in this, uh, in this uh, book, by the way, the event of the uh, as-sufi al-mutasanni' And the Imam's uh, condemnation of this deviant school uh, can be found in Rijal al Kishi, the primary okay. source. You find that when it came to preparing the Imam, 
the imam did a number of things one strategy that the imam used the imam used a number of strategies to educate the people and to convince the people to establish their yaqeen and their iman in the existence of an imam after him whom they cannot have access to physically yes there was a number of strategies and each strategy each strategy that was implemented by the imam was in accordance to the level of iman and the thiqa of the crowd that he's speaking to so depending on the crowd or depending on the type of people he was speaking to depending on the level of iman in which they were depending on the level of taqwa in which they were the strategy would be according to that it wasn't a one fit all solution the imam had very carefully planned out things hikmah divine hikmah selected by allah azza wa jal you find over here that he took for when it came to the khawas those people who were at the highest level of iman the imam increased their imam by actually giving them access to see imam al mahdi ajjal allah ta'ala farajahu sharif during his lifetime mm-hmm. you have over here this is an incident which is taken from the book kamaluddin an abi ghanim al khadim qala ولد لي ابي محمد عليه السلام ولد فسماه محمدا فعرضه على اصحابه يوم الثالث the companion says who is this companion abi ghanim who was a ghanim he was the khadim the servant of imam al askari the servant of imam al askari meaning that he was the most one of the most loyal companions to imam al askari one of the most staunch companions of Imam al-Askari such that the Imam trusted him enough to be in the household and serve the Imam because the Imam is administering the affairs of the entire ummah while being under imprisonment so okay. the people around him whom he chooses have to be the le- the level of the highest level of trust he says when the 12th imam was born 3 days after his birth he showed the baby the newborn baby yani the imam to this close companions and he said to him hada sahibukum min ba'di wa khalifati alaykum and he is the one who will reappear when the earth is filled with oppression and tyranny and fill it with peace and justice so the strategy over here is that those people who are of the highest level of iman they have seen the imam with their eyes and it was now their responsibility to go down to the people of lower faith lower level of iman and to give them that confidence and that yakin that the imam exists even though you cannot see him taib why did the imam just take the imam al askari just take imam al mahdi to all the shia and so him baba this is my mm-hmm. son is the imam after you because amongst those who are weak yes. there is a possibility that they would go to bani abbas oh. and they would uh, expose this great secret because secret. keeping the birth mm-hmm. of imam al hujja hidden was one of the greatest tasks of the imam bani um, bani abbas were hot on their heels looking for this newborn baby so that they could kill him and then you find over here that in another hadith the imam says to the people Musa ibn Ja'far ibn Wahhab al-Baghdadi he comes from Baghdad Imam is in Samarra he says sami'tu Aba Muhammad al-Hasan ibn Ali yaqul ka'anni bikum it is as if i'm with you wa qad ikhtalaftum ba'di fi al-khalaf minni it is as if i'm with you and i can see how you are disputing and have differences yani your unity as shia is shattered while you dispute over who is the imam after me hmm. imagine the extent of the fitna the shia umma are in dispute over the who the next imam is you get how fragile and sensitive that time is indeed and then he goes on to say the one who rejects the wilaya or the imama of my son after me 
is like the person he is like the same person who has attested to the imama of all or to the uh, who has attested to the nabuwa of all the anbiya and rejected the nabuwa of rasulullah and then this is the point before we end the show <coughs> he says amma inna li waladi ghaybatun yartabu fi hannas Indeed, for my son, there is an occultation, there is a ghayba, in which the hearts of the people will be tested. People will reach a level where they doubt the existence of the imam. Because of this ghayba, in brackets, because it was always understood, is that it is an imtihan through which people will fall into misguidance except those whom Allah has protected. And therefore, you find from this hadith for us to take a practical lesson from the life of Imam al-Asqari Ourselves, brothers, sisters, my respected parents, pray and pray and pray for the safeguarding of your faith and the faith of your children. Particularly safeguarding the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt. Today I could be a believer in Ahlul Bayt. Tomorrow I, well, I, will, I could turn out to be an enemy of Ahlul Bayt. I could be a believer of Imam Al-Hujjah today. Well, I, will, I become an enemy of Imam Al-Hujjah tomorrow. The salama and the safeguarding of the faith is the most important thing. Our belief in Imam al hujja in the ghaibah, person may not verbally negate the existence of the Imam, but negates the existence of the Imam through his actions. Mm. How convinced are we that the Imam exists and is watching over us and is going to reappear? For what goals the Imam is going to reappear? What does the Imam expect from us in the ghaibah? This connection with the Imam and keeping on the right path during the Ghaibah is something that needs to be of the highest priority, as shown to us by Imam al Askari. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sheikhna. And thank you to all our viewers for joining Amen. us. Inshallah, we'll be back on the next episode of the Live Facebook where the Sheikh will do another discussion uh, from a book with hadith from a book, Inshallah. We'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Oh.